Great. Okay, so I think last time on week zero, I informed you like what happens on Mondays is that just we'll go through the challenge so that everyone is clear um, what is actually expected. And you must not leave this session without actually having a clear understanding of what is expected. How to do it, you don't have to understand it because that, that is what the whole week is. But you must understand what is the challenge and what is expected from you, okay? So, and I will not normally, of course, tell you this is the challenge document, do this. I am going to ask you, what have you understood by reading the challenge document? And I will, minimum, I will take three people explaining to what the challenge document as they see it. And then from that, whatever is missing, then I will add. Um, so can anyone start how, you know, based on their reading of the challenge document? What have they understood? What have you understood? What is expected? What is the key things? Um, like that, you know, what are the tasks? Can someone tell us their understanding? You know, it, it, it doesn't have to be, if you don't, even if like you are kind of, didn't read it much, but just only skimmed through, that's still fine. This is just much more to make sure we, you have some form of understanding, right? You didn't just come to here. Okay, Jabez? Uh, can I start? Yes, please. Okay, so what I understand from the document is that there is a, a wealthy businessman who wants to invest, well, who likes to invest on un underrated businesses. So uh, he wants to, uh, previously, it says that previously he invested on a delivery company for uh, uh, students, university students, but now he wants to by uh, a telecom company so the task is that uh, in order to buy this telecom company he wants to understand if it is worth it so as a data analyst uh, our uh, task will be to analyze the, da the data that the company which is called i think teleco uh, they already gave us uh, some data about their uh, company so we need to analyze the data and decide if it is worth it if it's worth it to invest on that so to do that they are uh, the tasks are uh, categorized in different way uh, uh, so one thing is to do ed analysis to see the data and to understand if there is uh, outliers if there is missing values and to clean up the data then uh, do uh, modeling then I think at the end, uh, uh, we are required to do a dashboard so that the, it will be to show our uh, understanding of the data in vi uh, visual form. And to do that, we uh, should understand the Streamlit uh, library uh, to build the dashboard. I think overall, I see uh, only this uh, from skimming the document. Excellent. I think that's really a good summary, but I'm sure there are some elements that are missing, so probably others can add, but overall, yes, that's really a good understanding. Shayla? Hello. Hello. Um, hi, um, I hope everyone is well. So um, from the project, doc from the document for the challenge, what I understood is, this, is almost the same as Jabez. Um, I understood that there's an investor who wants to now um, invest into this new company that's called Telco and it's a telecommunication company. And he wants to be able to understand the data that they have and see whether it's worthy for selling or buying so that he can know how to handle it. And the data that we have been given is a data set that has information that is useful, that it has information about the customers for this particular company and also the activities that that they partake in. So um, basically from that, um, how is, as a data analyst, as me and the other, the rest of the group, we're supposed to be able to analyze this data and we're supposed to be able to get insights from this data, be able to visualize it. And um, in the at the end, we will be able to have a presentation that will be 
I don't know whether the investor is virtual or not, but we'll, we are supposed to have a presentation that will be able to help the investor understand um, the data that Telco has, understand their customers, the profitability, and everything. And in this presentation, we're supposed to have all the um, images that we have, the visualization images that we will have produced from the analysis of the data. Then also, it's going to be a little bit different from um, week zero because we are going to have like our EDA analysis is going to be connected in one code. Yeah, where we're going to use a pipeline to connect the code, and uh, from the challenge that from the challenge document, what I've gotten is that we're supposed to put in our best work and make sure that our visualizations are informative and also aesthetically pleasing and very presentable. So that is what I have gotten from the challenge document. Thank you. Yeah, excellent. Again, I think that's a good understanding. There are still certain details missing. So hopefully others will cover them. Hilary and then Abu Bakr, but Hilary first. Okay, good morning. And uh, from what I understood from the, from what I got from the challenge documents, uh, the rest have been mentioned, but for me is uh, the tasks, uh, the task, the different tasks, task two, three. The firstly is the use of view analysis where we are, we are, we are to analyze uh, the different, the, uh, the different uh, data that is pro that is that that the user that is that is of the user that uh, the company retrieved, including the sessions of the user and the data that the user used in different sites and all that. And then we are to analyze in task three the user engagement analysis, uh, how the user engages with the with the different devices and the telecom. Uh, this is because uh, in a telecom com telecommunication, uh, mostly users the user satisfaction and the engagement of the user uh, uh, normally uh, determines whether the company is uh, successful in providing that and uh, the the user experience in giving a good user experience. And also we have the uh, satisfaction analysis in task five, where um, we are where we are told. Uh, we are to analyze about how the user is satisfied uh, with the, with especially with the with the usage of the of the phone and the telecommunication. And um, I think that is what I got for the different tasks, apart from the technical side of coding and uh, and also uh, to integrate a Postgres PostgreSQL DB. In this case, it is different also from the last time. We are not given the data sets the the specific CSV files, but in this case, we are to to retrieve the data from PostgreSQL uh, directly uh, since, and also save it there after having our features. That's it. Thank you. Great. Um, again, I think that's good. I think in overall it's covered, but there can be still some things missing. Maybe Abubakar, do you want to go? Uh, okay, thank you, Abdullah. Um, yes, I think, <coughs> sorry, uh, most of uh, them are mentioned by the other uh, team. So, uh, uh, I think most of them mentioned the technical aspects, but uh, I will try to give my understanding on non technical aspects. For example, we are required to do a data analysis that. Uh, for example, as mentioned uh, on Telco, is it worth buying or not? That is the main goal of the challenge. So uh, from dashboard creation or articulating the problem and giving a clear direction for the investor or stakeholders uh, in a clear and concise way. For example, dashboard creation, report writing goes <coughs> Not all of them, not all stakeholders are as technical as it gets. So in a clear and uh, actionable way, it needs to be uh, addressed. Uh, from technical side uh, and data analysis, uh, such as uh, algorithm writing, uh, business context reasoning, uh, may, like um, main uh, writing a maintainable and uh, modular code. 
that is reusable for next time or probably other uh, other time so i think most of them are this one so it would probably be since the ten academy intensive program is uh, being work ready i think these things also matter i guess yeah excellent again i think they added yes some really key parts uh, in actually decomposing them as just technical and non-technical but you know non-technical most of the time means it is not as it sounds simple it's the most complex part of any technical work is the non-technical component yeah. that means to really whatever you do nobody cares whether you work or not just that you know any business cares on the net technical component which is you know should i buy or not you know this is not a technical the technical leads something that actually then becomes a business question right answering the business question and while similarly it you, you must do more technical to answer some key questions in the non-technical sense right so the basically whether you know how accurate are we how confident are we again that's technical but technical when it's a statistical but maybe just the, the you know ultimately once you have the data how you answer it and how you argue for it might be you know might might share so that's it's very important to know the key thing to everything that you do the reason you get paid of course is because you are coding but ultimately people don't pay you because you're coding it's because your code is useful and you must understand that key com key elements throughout we try to highlight it but you must also never forget you know yes people pay you a lot of money for your code but not for your code but because your code is useful if you just code something that's not useful nobody pays you right so it's not the, the it's not the code that matters but the code that's useful and how do you make it that's useful is the, the, the question. Okay, now I think most of it is mentioned and now we could just stop here, but I'm sure you will have questions and you should generate questions. So that means even if, so if you are not generating questions, that means you're not thinking critically because I will have even many questions just even after you know knowing many things and I will have also lots of questions. So now let's start who is, was question and you know think about questions it's not an option just think one question at least a minimum such that it helps you better understand what is expected anyone with question like what have you know what do you want to understand kumi uh thank you uh i have a question about the string lit uh, source uh, source code that you provide us. I okay. try to go to the GitHub repository, and uh, I think there is a lot. There is a lot on the GitHub, and I don't really know if you have a specific part we should focus on. Um, yeah, um, that's a good question. Uh, so I must share my screen, maybe, so that. Ah, again, I don't know what I've mm -hmm. uh, window. So now you should probably see my screen. Not yet. No. Yep. Do you see my screen? Yeah, there is visible. Okay, great. Um, so we specifically gave you just the lib. The link is to the lib, right? This is just the Python part. Um because as you would understand when you read about streamlit streamlit has is basically a react um component that is connected to basically for to to do all the visualization into the dashboard it has react components 
and each of the React components, of course, in the Python part is calling ultimately, or just connected to um, to those React components. So whatever you write in Python, they have an equivalent component in React. And I think if we gave you, um, or not here, but it's probably somewhere down on the reference. Um, Fortunately, it doesn't seem so. Yeah, uh, so, okay, maybe just, maybe it's the same. Okay, so we'll share, I'll share here in the same code, but there is um, like how things are connected. If you are to add, for example, one single component, your own component and how how you would write it in uh, React and then how you would write it also in Python. So that's basically um, the part. But the element that we ask you is just to look at the source code of the Python. So if you look on the streamlit, then you get you know all of the, for example, all of the connections or elements, you know, and in there you get just balloons, empties, you know, all of that. Um, so it's about to review how they write. So for example, if you are creating a form in a streamlit, this is what you're going to be using. And just, you will learn from how, first, how they write code, right? How they import, how, you know, they write code, how they structure, um, and, and, and basically the, the different types of it, right? So it's about reviewing, reviewing how the codes are structured in the Python element. So overall, just you should look and understand, you know, in general, how React, uh, sorry, Streamlit works. And within that Streamlit, already this tells you the structure of the Python component. But if you go just to the whole React, then there is, there are the front end and, and many other components. And we just gave you only just at least the link is more on the, on the lead part. But if you go to the front end, and the front end is mostly, I think, um, that's written in React. So that's basically, if you go to the deep part of that, um, you would you would look at many of their their thing in um, basically in in JavaScript codes, right? So um, so I hope that answers your question. So our part or the the part that you are reviewing is the Python the Python source. Does that address your question? Uh, sorry, uh, I was having an internet issue, so, oh, sorry. Okay. I just rejoined the call now. Okay, so I mean, just briefly to say, you are going to be reviewing only just the Python component, so the, or the Python part of Streamlit. And the Python part is just, a wrapper for the React components. So this Streamlit code is all you have mostly, which contains many of the elements, either as part of the elements or as part of, um, I think mostly just this, the elements are the key, but the components are also just contains, for example, the different types of types, how it's defined. So you are gonna be reviewing just in short, the Python version or the Python component of Streamlit. Do you, are you connected or is still you have an issue in your internet for me? So Abu Bakar, you, uh, you asked another question, so if you are to start learning Streamlit from the beginning, how would you go about it? So there are, for everything to learn, there are, you know, it's a very general question, right? So if you were to just use it, of course, you go and look at the tutorials. If you are, if you want to be contributing, so that means as, you are, as a developer, then of course you look at the code, how like basically um, 
like how it's developed. So I would be normally um, looking at the very source and then I would be going and just there's going to be a contribute somewhere. So for example, this has the gate inspire, but um, there should be, yeah, extend streamlit, you know, capabilities, for example, or um, so this is what I was actually referring. So this will explain to you uh, I mean, they, they have their own actually error. Um, I'll try to do. Yeah, they have error on their code. So normally I would join a Streamlit forum or and then I would look at uh, how to contribute section. So it's almost always learning depends what. I mean, I mostly a lot of people use Streamlit as just a user. And and just. So this is probably would would tell you a lot more about what each component does. I don't think still is for a developer. This is still um, as a developer, you would most of the time look at the code and study the code itself, how it's structured, starting from, of course, understanding, learning, maybe just it could be via blog or it could be um, in the forum asking questions and then of course looking at the docs just the, the part so almost always you, are, you have two com two things competing one is how to use it which sometimes allows you to learn of course more about what it does so and then from that you would go into like looking at the code so once you have a general understanding of you know what it does um, and how the, the coding, how things are relating. For example, you, you should understand, okay, behind, even if you are coding in Python, behind there, it's just they are using not, for example, um, WebAssembly. If they were to use WebAssembly versus React, that's a very different for development, right? So, because WebAssembly would be just a direct compilation in the browser while if they are using React, then they are going through a JavaScript um, kind of wrapper. Most of the old Python dashboards are actually happens using like a JavaScript because the way you know the browser only understands uh, JavaScript in the past. So most of it were actually on top of JavaScript. Nowadays, there is WebAssembly. That means you can actually run uh, almost all browsers support WebAssembly, which means they can you can actually directly uh, compile Python in the browser. So you don't need to go, and that means it's faster. But Streamlit, for example, is using still the JavaScript component. Maybe they have, they might be migrating to WebAssembly in the future. Understanding that kind of element is useful. And then after that, just I think as we just tell you, like you should be um, then looking at the code. You know, how are they structured? Where is what? So, you know, what are these different components? And then, for example, in the Python, maybe look at implementing one, just one simple component so that you understand end to end. That means you know, you know, what to import and how to connect. And so basically, once you do that, you start adding more and more. So I hope that I answered it in a much more broader way your question, but I hope that answers uh, your question. Okay. Okay. Uh, okay. I will come to you, Hilary. But before that, Mahuba, uh, Mahupapa, I think if I pronounce your name, in the previous week, we were given the data set. And on this week's challenge, I saw that we should extract the data from the. You have to load the data to our local. Yeah. It, it is a, what we give you is a, a, a Postgres dump. So, sure. Yeah. It's easier if you just, you know, 
uh, then load it into your local PSQL server. So in that way, it, it gets easier. And I think because we want absolutely people to, to use more advanced SQL, you know, you can use in Python, if you're just using just Python, of course, you, you have like, you can just write all the SQL things in Python, just like the same as you can write, you can use pandas, you can write actual SQL uh, to, to do many of your processing in pandas or just use some of the methods. So it's, it's the same in, um, you know, if you are using some Python libraries, um, you could do the same. So, but the more you use just an actual SQL, the better it is just for your own learning. But from the actual addressing the, the business objective perspective, it doesn't matter. It's, you know, you, you choose how to incrementally learn. So, you know, whichever way you do, whether you just purely on Python, even if it's, of course, you are connecting to a Postgres, but um, whether you use that or not, for us, it has less importance, but at least address, you know, get to the basic, the, the best part. But for extracting and connecting, um, we advise a lot more that you learn a little bit of SQL. If you don't know, and if you, if you know already, demonstrate it. I hope that is um, clear. Move on. And then, Tamaskin, your project folder should mirror as possible the example extremely triple. Uh, no, it doesn't mean. It just means just learn from the best. So that means just at, at least that one for now. If you were to do, you know, Streamlit is really a well known and very good package. So the same as is Scikit-Learn or Pandas. In principle, you should open the source code of this and then see how big packages structure their code. And in this case, we gave you already Streamlit. So just uh, you know learn from it so it doesn't mean you have to create all the components like all type of things there and actually this will be a part of a, and this in court b in particular in other courts we didn't do much uh, and court we will do is really for you to reflect when do, when do you create a, a folder a new folder how do you split a code when it's large you know, a lot of the people we have seen in the past, they actually use one notebook to do so many things. That's really not efficient. You should be naming your, like, for example, let's say the, the best practices most people do are for each of the task two, task three, task four, task five, they have one, at least, um, um, so one notebook. But it would be nice also instead of notebook, let's say task one, task task five task two task three task four task five you have actually one folder in each of them like for example when you are exploring the data you have let's say one notebook and you call it underscore zero zero and then underscore zero one would be something underscore zero one would be maybe when you are now going to the next phase like when you are modeling one part like you know one is exploring the data loading and, and ensuring understanding the data structure and the second part would be when you are actually, let's say, in the first one, engagement, you know, in the user analysis, like maybe just some parts of top, whatever, when you're analyzing one, or when you are feeling and kind of model, you know, some, some other, like a slightly, a completely different process that requires another notebook. If you do that, you know exactly, you know, then you will not be overwhelmed. In the code also, your notebook will not be so big that you, it will not slow down your computer. So structuring your code will help you. But of course, most people don't, doesn't have yet a feeling um, um, on how to do that, but you will be, you should be learning or should be um, informing. So yeah, it means just structure such that it is understandable. The same as if you look now, the, the streamlit, it's clearer. You understand where what lib is, what component is, what element is, you know, only from the folder structure already you learn a lot. So your code should be similar with me. I hope that answers your question, Damascus. Um, and then let's go to Hillary and then we can come back. So Hillary, Hillary just you can ask your question. Uh, uh, yeah, I think I've taken my question in the chat, but uh, I'll say um, 
if for the for I'm looking at task three point one and it says submit Python script and slide. Uh, does it mean to? So which one is that? Which one? Task three point one. Task three point one. Okay. Yep. Yeah. Um, uh, uh, based on the above, submit Python script and slide. Uh, does it mean to write the code and then later it'll be checked on the GitHub repo? We'll submit. And for the slide, I, I, I'm assuming I it's the presentation. Yes. So I think this one, so none of like, even if like the writing here submits Python script and slide, doesn't mean here all the what you need to submit. So this is much more sometimes you will do it later, right? So, but almost everything that you are required to submit is just here on the deliverables. So you don't need to do much. Uh, this is all we care, right? So in between that, for sometimes facilitating, we just say this and that. But ultimately, you know, I think we it's consider it, that one is not a task. I mean, that, that is basically a task description. So not a deliverable. So that all the deliverables are then collected and just basically given here. In the interim submission, you will deliver this. All you have to do is here. Of course, there, for example, if you have been doing task three, just add that script maybe as part of your GitHub. And then the the report or the slide is probably part of the, you know, part of the PDF. Right? So just I want it to be clear that submitting inside the task description is not, it's just basically a part. So, I mean, I will just be, um, just we can, Okay, so it's probably clearer now, right? Yes. So everything in these tasks are not, I mean, they are description of the task, what you do. It's just to, to make sure that it is easier, you know, we break it down so that you follow. Because normally this is really, um, I hope somebody would ask, this is how do you normally, if you were, if I were just to give you, if you were a senior person, would give you a data and then we just ask you, you know, tell us whether it's a good investment or not. And your task would be then to break it into this. Okay, first, you know, you design, it's a design component, right? Okay, first you design maybe just that I'm going to do some kind of user overview analysis so that I get a better understanding. And then second, you would basically be understanding, okay, now, I, because engagement is important, like engagement is helpful for a business. Right. If users are engaging, so first is I would I would understand the property of the user, right? So who are who are my users? And so that I might classify them as wealth users, non-wealth users based on their, you know, whether they have iPhone versus you know smartphone or not, this or that, you know, different things. And second, okay, now I want to know because ultimately profit relates to engagement, you know, how much are they engaging with our services, different services both call services as well as also uh, our data services. That means uh, internet, right? So, okay, and then uh, later, maybe once I got that, now I need to combine many things to be able to, because I am predicting the future, if I am predicting the future, I want to understand like whether their experience is just like any cafe, you know, you may engage in the cafe, but if you're not happy with their coffee or tea, you might not go back. So understanding their experience tells you a lot more about the future. And then not only experience, which is just what you are going to be looking, but also you might be looking at their satisfaction level, right? Are they satisfied or is it just something growing or, or shrinking? You know, are there many churns or many of these things? So this part you would have, if you were senior, you would have been doing it yourself. You, were, you would have been decomposing the task of, whether you know advising a, uh, an investor to buy or not, or whether a company is you know profitable or not, you would have to design, break down into multiple tasks, and do it. So 
we have done that for you and this should be the lesson you know in principle it's really not easy straightforward to estimate how good a company is operating or not and this type of way of breaking down you should learn from it as well okay so not only doing it but also how to decompose a task such that you get to to the goal to the business question is what is there so all the challenge this the tasks are you know breaking down for you so that you can attack the problem of the business objective which is inferring whether uh you know a company or some business is profitable or not whether it is highly already you know um is it undervalued or uh, overvalued type of analysis happens through this so so these are descriptions and then the deliverables are written so after doing all of that you always need to look to know what are your deliverables ultimately so the deliverables are basically okay you once you do that ultimately you're not going to be delivering code maybe just you know the investor might not understand code so you don't just give them code right you can you you give them um, a report like a presentation but maybe the of course not only maybe but the investor may have a technical other advisors that will check your code for its validity because and that for you you would also submit your code if you work in a poor or anywhere that's what you do you still have to explain your work in a layman term as well as also just have to provide the code so that they can the company use it so it's very similar so every of the deliverables you have to just basically what you're going to be delivered at the end will be is written here and if you don't understand you have to ask but this is it and all of that is breaking down the task so that you can achieve um the business objective okay i hope that's clear uh hillary yes it's clear Thank okay you. anyone else any question there are so many things i would have asked as well even now so so uh abu Bakr, i think there will be a, a you know github actions are basically when you push a code it basically is how to automate you know it's basically that's an automation tool that based on the github actions which are in the you know if we look again i think i'm presenting so let's look at already stream this how many do they have they implemented github actions you know that they have github actions when you look at the dot github so the dot github is what tells github that i have inside there you know different actions that needs to be performed when i push a code and which parts will be defined there so let's look at the github uh, component so they have of course so many things and they are some of them are basically you know if we look the release this is how the they will describe the categories and the labels so these are just like if you learn what the github actions some of them the workflows are the main thing that that automates and the actions are libraries for the workflows and the scripts of course you can also use them like um import them inside your github actions right so just so mostly we would look at the workflows and the workflow there are many things that they have defined of course so when they push depending on what is written inside inside that things happen for example let's just maybe uh pipe review so now this is the language of the github action so the name is pr review and on just defines what happens you know when does this pr preview.yml will be executed it's executed when it is a push inside a branch called develop or pull request for types types are defined somewhere uh, of opened synchronized or reopened right so whenever there is a pull request on this this pr preview will be executed and the concurrency then this they will define what it means you know and then jobs basically what each of them will be executed one by one and and the steps ultimately when they are and um, when they are performed the first thing is that they the the code will be checked out 
The second thing will be these are descriptions will be uh, you have Python. They say it, you know Python version will be set, and second is virtual environment will be created. Then will files. Then you know the will files will be stored, and then environment variables are set, and things like that. And then if there are AWS key IDs, things will be um, redone, and then this script, which is a bash script, will be run, right? So first they install, of course, AWS CLI and things like that. So this is basically, now they have many things depending on everything. So CI, CD, this is a continuous integration, some part of it, some part of the GitHub actions are for, um, to actually do continuous integration. That means when a code is integrated, it runs unit test, it does something, it does something, it does something. One part of it is for integration. And one other part of GitHub action is that also if it's, for example, pushed in the, you know, in the deployment uh, branch, it might then go and deploy the continuous development. So CI and CD, which is a continuous integration and the continuous development can be happened by, of course, the, um, uh, the, the, the GitHub actions. So GitHub actions can be used. There are many other, like, just like that, you have also Travis and many others that do very similar. GitHub Actions now are just all, like, part of the GitHub, so anyone can run. So, there will be a tutorial, but that's the basic gist of it, Abu Bakr. So, it's just writing some YAML files and what have, and telling GitHub what to do when pushes code, you know, when code is pushed where, uh, and where and what needs to be done if it needs to be deployed. So, and there will be tutorial. Okay, anything else? Is everything super clear for everyone? No, I think this, this would be there, but also I think a lot of this probably univariate means normally just you, you plot one column at a time. You know, it's just basically one variable at a time. So if there are many variables, if you are understanding, univariate basically uni means one so you're basically learning about the distribution of that the missing values in the univariate this or that of just single columns by variate means more than one so you can have uh you know between two columns for example correlations correlations showing using you know by variate analysis usually means using correlation types but multivariate means not only two now that you you actually have now multiple columns you try to in you know visualize them or features you, you create other features and all that so that's basically what it means it's just very simply a naming okay anything else i hope that is clear Binyam. and if not there will be also statistical uh, tutorials so that you can ask there as well I mean, I think Enoch, I don't know. I think this is, I don't think it's about compute power for Linux versus Windows or that. It is convenience or not. And and some people are more convenient with Windows. I think normally we tell you to install Linux because most of the tutors and everyone has Linux so that they help you better in Linux. If you have issue in Windows, you have to normally deal with that with yourself because there isn't much we use um, Windows, so that means we can't help you much if, if you get stuck within that. Um, but other than that, it's, it should be fine. I think I don't think it's a compute power. Again, maybe you can ask that one in Slack and others. Uh, Mac OS and Linux are the same, like in a way that they use the same things, like behind the scene is the same. So if you have Mac OS, then it's the same as Linux more or less. So everyone can help you. I think, you know, most people who know Linux can help you in Mac OS as well. Um, okay. What about, okay, Abu, like, are there questions? Are, are there handsets, like if, um, Abu Bakr, do you want to raise? Uh, wanna... Yes, yes. Uh, yes. So, uh, Last time on um, last week, I was trying to uh, move with zero code to a uh, collab, 
so i've been uh, i've been working on which there i've been working locally and uh, i think some tasks took long time and i had to cut the data and uh, i was experimenting on collab so uh, i was having a bit of hard time uh, getting it to work for example like utilities class uh, guitar pushing from the collab stuff i think it was meant for only uh, jupyter notebooks i think but if i somehow got it working i'm not so sure uh, if i should on week one is this call, uh, challenge uh, if i should be working locally or uh, on collab so yeah, what you know my, my 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 advice is that almost always it is possible it's just a matter of figuring it out really nail it figure it out just use it afterwards you know in a way almost always it, it's just the first time when you use something it might be very difficult but it's possible that you know definitely collab and github can be connected so if you want to use it if you have a good uh, case make sure just nail it and just maybe write even a, a whatever issue you encounter write it as just as a help for others maybe blog it if you want um, but almost always it's about when you want to use it again for something again and again nail it and become good at it and then i think it's possible just maybe you might need to understand you know may there are many blocks around around how you, you would connect because definitely it's possible uh, yeah sorry uh yes uh, it, it it actually uh what uh i think it was three days ago but uh I'm not so sure if I should. No, I, I mean, I, I think, as I said, you must have a, a your own case, right? So, like, if you if it takes you time, don't use it. But if you have a case that because it gives you, it makes you more productive, solve it. Maybe just find people, peers, and you know, post it in Slack and figure out how together. But it's not. I mean, it's not an advice. Like, use or not use is a lot more about what makes you productive for us it doesn't matter what you do but just make sure you are productive i mean for me almost always i focus that you are more productive whether you use python you know whether you use sorry uh cola whether you use local whether you use anything make sure that you are faster that means you are you know with whatever you do you can code fast you can see results fast and you are more motivated you know that so it's all about that. It's all of these tools are trying to make you faster. If it's like, for example, Colab, there is a loading time. But the only the good thing, maybe if your laptop is slightly weaker, maybe Colab then make you faster by that, you know, even if connection, opening, whatever, sometimes has an issue because it provides you a compute power that is better than your laptop, maybe that you are better off. But it's about really waiting what you have and if you have a good laptop there is no probably need unless you want to use now maybe um gpus that they provided there but if you also have a, an okay gpu then maybe you don't need it only then if you share with other people right but then for sharing you also have maybe like github so you can share with it so you know it's a pros and cons that you have to and then ultimately it must be it must whatever you use must make you better not just uh, so i think the choice is yours not ours unfortunately i hope that is uh addresses your concern okay hillary yes uh, my question is uh since you are using postgres for, for the most part uh on the on the last part let's say for deployment uh are we still going to use SQL for the storing the feed? Like, how do we use no, SQL features and good, deploy for Streamlit? Yeah, that's a good question. For that one, of course, all you need is, you know, like anything, you you are deploying and you don't need Postgres or that the, you know, the cloud, the Streamlit cloud doesn't support that for you. So what you need to do is basically export the tables and use a CSV uh, for that because once you reach a deployment, you know that the data doesn't change, right? So you have already, so you can just export whatever you need, put it in the data and, and use that, the CSV. 
you don't need for deployment you don't need to think about how to connect with database local deployment of streamlit you can still use um your database but when you are actually deploying in the cloud you can use just the csv export the csv for the because you know which features you need for visualization so that's very clear yeah go on yeah thank you i have one more one more question yeah, yeah, for progress can um i i had an issue integrating it uh, yeah i mean running the tables in my local locally so can i use a docker uh, yeah, absolutely. Can you, can you suggest that I use Docker, Postgres in a Docker absolutely. container? Yes, many people use that. So I would recommend, yeah, if you have issue installing Postgres in your like normal computer, just use Docker. And it, almost always, if you can use Docker better, like in a way, it's just, it just, you know, the hassle is easier and becoming good in Docker is very good. Okay, any other question? As I said, you, everyone should have one question and I should, right now only few people are asking, but I'm expecting everyone to ask question. Because if you really wanna, like if you're thinking about it, you, you will have questions. If you're thinking about it very critically. So. Okay, um, then I will just, just for the sake of, I mean, that's not what I expected. I was expecting a lot more people have questions. Okay, so maybe the other way I have question. Uh, Sheila? Oh, hello, um, my question was, would you, could you please guide us on uh, chaining the code connection where we're supposed to chain multiple EDA steps? Sorry? The guide us on, on in the instructions part there's a part whereby we're supposed to do a code connection whereby we're supposed to chain multiple eda steps ah so you mean the pipelining yes ah so just it's uh, like scikit has a pipeline yeah so just basically use the scikit pipeline so pipeline means for example data frame if you now output a data frame it outputs another data frame Right. So, for example, if you filter a data frame to have only some values, you know, uh, to drop none, for example, null values, then what the output is another data frame. So you can connect that one. You can add then, OK, dot something, dot something, dot something. Now, if you write multiple functions that does your analysis using a pipeline, you can connect them because the output of one for example, the cleaning output can go into visual uh, generation. Uh, or for example, splitting the data into train tests and, and validation. And then after that, another code accepts that and trains. So all of that can be connected, right? Because the, just like the input of something, the output of something can be the input of another code. And then the output of that can be the input of another code. So it's chaining that together. So being able to use, you know, to know, to learn how to how to connect steps, you know, that you 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 then build in terms of okay, I'm gonna do one step, which has this input and that output, and the output of this one goes into this code, then which then processes and outputs something, and that output of that will be onto, will be the input of another code. So it's you kind of chain them together. Okay, thank you. Okay. Jo Joseph or Joseph? Uh, excuse me. Yes, uh, hi, uh, Yabadel. Hi. Um, so yeah, my, my question is, um, so you can actually, con you can actually uh, come up with a code uh, that makes a pipeline your data loading to the overview, to the EDA, I uh, know to, to mean that to the data cleaning, and uh, then to the uh, 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 the EDA, then to the machine learning and the modeling, you can um, put all this in a pipeline. Yes, I mean it's just these are all different codes that does something, right? So some of them filter. You know, almost always what happens 
what happens is that every step of data understanding, so the visualization, it's because for your consumption, normally you don't put them. But if you have to like also put them as part of, for example, dashboard building, you can put them. But the other parts, which is, for example, a new data comes in, what happens is that you take that data and first maybe you do, you know, you check if there are uh, null values. Maybe you drop them or you impute them. That means you fill them. So that's a part of a code that does that. And then it takes the field value and maybe then selects the, the right columns, the, the right features. And then maybe another code that basically combines feature engineering, it creates some features. And then it will take them from that one and maybe then another code that splits this into train whatever. And another code that actually then trains some model. And another code that actually takes this one and save the model in ML flow or something. And another like that. And all of them normally, you know, pipeline means now let's imagine you want to do this again and again, but maybe also uh, on a different chunk of a code, right? So instead of you running all of them, So when you look at the psychic pipeline or any other pipelining, you can do that. And you just learn how to, you know, just chain together things. It usually means just thinking about input outputs. So you, you, you take, you expect some output from one part and then you expect it in one code as an input. And if that is the case, you know, you basically can easily chain them. Okay, uh, Mahabuba. So, if also just if you can help me pronounce your name so that in the future I can call you better. Pronounce it. Mahabuba is uh, correct or? We, I can't hear you, Mahabuba. Okay, unfortunately, I'm free. Okay, so if you are speaking, unfortunately, we can't hear you. Um, okay, so just then I would, because no one focuses on that part, I will focus on one additional element that is key, um, given especially that a lot of, of people at the end in their job interview what they are failing or they are not understanding is the component of learning or knowing about what they code as i said so this component of learning about your code complexity in terms of running time memory size as well as also what type of data structure data structure means in python sometimes a list a set you know a dictionary or just a simple uh, array that you're using all of these are data structures some and learning about what is good for where and what does what its order of magnitude of computes like usually or scaling so scaling means now the data might be fifty thousand rows but what about if it's if it's now a billion rows or a million rows you know does your code still work and do you know you know what data structures you have used in your code so that part is very key because this this investor even for this one might have given you just a very small sample of the the data so that you can you can prepare yourself they might give you now a much bigger data not only for like a one month but maybe uh, let's say the last 10 years data so how is your code that you prepared on this how, do, how will that handle? So that part, you must understand. So the Wednesday submission, unlike, bef unlike in any other court, you, your, your submission only is expected to actually quant learn about the data structures in your own code, as well as on the scikit, you just a few keys, but in your code, what are the data structures that are used and how, you know, what is that a good choice that you've used? You, did you use dictionary over, lists for a good reason and how's the you know if the code now if the amount of code, uh, data is 
now multiplied by so it's so in the daily variables you will see it if now the data size grows by a million you know how will how are things you, you know the memory handling as well as the compute time compute time normally is for for the you know to transform something to something so you should be looking and learning and reading on on the data structures and algorithms so some, even if you use pandas for example which part of pandas did you use did you use just basically the one that says you know like map dot map or did you use dot filter or did you just use something else did you iterate over for loop each of the rows and how is that a impact in terms of your data structure and algorithm so you should be all your wednesday submission is about that okay writing and and commenting about the data structure and algorithm in your code in your eda code okay so that's key and for most of you that may just was not but the reason is because this investor really is just gave you only a very sample data and uh, and the person expects that your code handles now a much bigger data and so for that reason you the first submission he wants is about your code you know how is the data structures so of course it's not the investor only who checks that one it is the investors technical advisor so that one should be clear and if you haven't paid attention is that clear yeah reusable actually means that for example you used um you used if the data now increases by size that you actually can use the like you have written it in a class in a pipeline way that it, you're not going to be you're going to use the same code if you have done for example everything in uh, without just a structure then the code now you are repeating again and again for example just to filter data in one notebook you have the same code in the other notebook you have the same code and if you change one place for example you, you made a mistake at the last side now you have to change it everywhere reusable means that actually some of these key com components are as part of a class or function and that they become in a file and you are importing them when you do so the same thing so you use only you know for one thing in a number of times in a number of contexts to use them for example when you load data you might be using the same function so it's that modularity okay great that you understood yeah again this is statistics mean is normally those people who are good in statistics they know mean and median are the same if the distribution is gaussian if the distribution of something is not Gaussian, mean means mean and median are different. So, of course, by looking at the distribution of something, you can you can check which one is appropriate to use. And if you are using, for example, when to use mod, mod is something that, of course, is slightly different. Like if you are normally like a, a discrete variable or categorical variable, normally you use mod just such that you know when you are feeling for example or imputing uh, a color things like that so it's about looking at distribution so michael hopefully that that clarifies it's about learning a little bit of what makes sense because distribution in the past you might not have paid attention but when you're doing data analysis and eda it's important to know the distribution so that you to know what makes sense you know does variance for example of something make sense Variance makes sense if the distribution is Gaussian, but if it's something else, might be. And also if the data is, for example, uh, not a lot and categorical, maybe that it might be binomial, might be a, a yeah. So of course these are statistics. Most of the people struggle in statistics, but it's okay, just build intuition over time and learn more about it. I hope that's clear, Michael. okay so our time is up not many questions i hope it is clear 
So then whatever else, ask and explore. But I am slightly for those people who haven't asked it. I know you are not a superstar yet. You will be superstar, but by not asking, you are delaying your superstar uh, mode. So please prepare to ask more questions. And I would want Monday to be the Monday challenge document walkthrough to be just filled with lots of questions, critical mindedness, and really making sure that your question is helping others. If you are not asking, you really are mean. That means you are not helping anyone. So for next one, please just be kind and ask questions. Okay? Come back with lots of questions. I like, I'm prepared. And those people who have asked today, thank you so much for your contribution. You, you, not only you helped yourself, but you really helped others. So that, you know, in, in these conversations, many people learned a lot. Um, so thank you for your contribution. Okay, we'll stop here. And then, Academy's team, can you stop the recording?